Hello, folks. My name is Rick Pearson. Welcome to Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. We've learned in past weeks that in the latter days, certain sins would tempt believers, causing them to fall away from their faith. Now, although most believers live a moral life when it comes to fidelity of marriage, there is one topic that seems to stir emotions more than any other. And that topic is how you maintain the fidelity of your money. Stay tuned, you need to hear this. Folks, by this time in our teaching, everyone should know that the root word of Babylon is Babel, which means confusion. From previous programs, we've learned that there are seven types of end time believers that would be affected by that spirit of confusion. Now, these believers would have to overcome certain sins in order to be worthy and chosen and rewarded as the bride of Christ. So let's review their descriptions and at the same time, Let's give ourselves a checkup from the neck up to see if we identify with any of them. Believers of Ephesus dealt with not prioritizing God as the first love in their life. Jesus summed it up this way. Love God with all your heart and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you pattern your life after this protocol, you will fulfill all his commandments. Now, believers of Sardis missed the mark by doing good works opposed to doing God's works. Scripture says Jesus was moved with compassion and went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That same compassion for helping others was missing in the believers of Sardis. Believers in Smyrna were persecuted believers. The Bible promises those who are persecuted to hold on because great rewards are coming your way. Believers in Pergamos were st struggling with the issues of sexual immorality. They were seduced to follow the herd of modern-day Babylonian hedonism instead of the word of biblical mor moral protocol. Meanwhile, Thyatira, like Pergamos, allowed a Jezebel church leadership to seduce them not only into immorality, but dealing with unwanted children by literally sacrificing them to Baal in the hope of financial blessing. But perhaps the most common sin that all believers would be forced to deal with in the end times occurred in the believers of Laodicea. Now, these believers had an issue with something that everyone today deals with on a daily basis money. Now, money's not the problem within the context of Laodicea, but rather how the believers prioritize their money. Now, you may think your money does not matter to God, but Scripture states much differently. Listen to this. In the earliest days of Bible times, man did not have the medium of exchange we refer to today called money. Instead, they had the barter system, they would trade with each other animals, crops, precious stones, or whatever they had of equal value within their substance. However, the handling of a person's substance or accumulated wealth was one way that God evaluated a person's character or spirit. It was through the person's material substance that God demanded worship. The ancient Jewish people were mandated to give 10% of their first fruits. This is why farmers were commissioned to leave a portion of food in the fields for the poor and widows. Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible states, Leviticus chapter 27 verses 30 through 33 establishes that all the seeds from the land and the fruits from the trees belong to God, and a tenth of all herd and flock are holy to the Lord. The people were expected to tithe their grain, wine, oil, 
and firstlings from the herd and flock. The tithe also included a social component to care for the poor within society. And every third year, the tithe must be set aside for the Levite, the resident alien, the orphan, and the widow. Blessings from God are directly connected to this mandate. The worshiper is to make all offerings, including the tithe, with joy and happiness. In Genesis chapter 14, the first man ever called prophet, Abraham, defeated his enemies in battle and gave one-tenth of his spoils to Melchizedek, the high priest of the Most High God. Immediately after the act of worship, the Lord appeared to Abraham in a vision and told him, Fear not, Abraham, for I am your shield, and your reward shall be very great. It was at that time that Abraham was promised a son who would be heir to the patriarchal Jewish race. Two generations later, Abraham's grandson Jacob chose to participate in his grandfather's covenant with God by declaring, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. However, the priority of receiving God's blessings was to establish oneself in a preferred position between God and man, so that God could use Abraham and his descendants to release his blessing to others. Blessing others is what God calls righteousness in Hebrew protocol. The Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, which literally means acts of loving kindness. According to many rabbinical and Christian theologians, the giving of tithe or first fruits of one's wealth was to prevent the Jewish people from becoming greedy and materialistic and allowed them to flow in acts of loving kindness to those less fortunate. They were blessed so they could be a blessing to the world. However, the Church of Laodicea, it seems, has a problem when it comes to the handling of money. Welcome back, folks. You know, I find it fascinating to see that from the very beginning of man, even Adam had a mandate from God to work and produce substance for his existence. From that first commandment, God would transcend his acts of loving kindness to offer provision, guidance, and direction to whoever would call upon his name. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. We've already learned in previous programs that God would not only provide covenant with the nation of Israel, but to any nation or person who wanted to participate in that relationship. That covenant was based on man's free will to participate in it. Now, the covenant protocol woven through Scripture was also placed into the financial judicial system of North America. The progressive tax code helped finance government social programs, as well as the prosperity incentives of capitalism, which are based on giving and receiving. But as everyone knows, that concept of giving and receiving has been compromised over the years by corruption and greed. People no longer want to give in order to receive. They just want to receive, and they will lie, steal, embezzle, defraud, do anything for personal gain, which, of course, God calls sin. Sin is termed in Scripture as missing the mark. So the most common denominator within the church for missing the mark is found in the sixth group of believers Jesus called the Church of Laodicea. And that missing ingredient was tied directly to money and how people were abusing its purpose. For I know thy works, for thou art neither cold nor hot. So then because you are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and have prospered and need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, blind, and naked. Now, to further explain this passage in the ministry, Jesus told a parable of a rich man. In Luke, he said, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones and store my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, for many years, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, you fool, tonight thy soul is required of thee, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, what's interesting in this passage, 
that when referring to the rich man, the Bible uses the word plusius, which the Greek English dictionary defines as rich or well-to-do. It's the same word used when the Laodicean believer says, I am rich. However, when this same scripture refers to being rich towards God, it uses the Greek word pluteo, meaning not only to prosper, but also to be generous. This is the same word used when the Laodicean believer says, I have prospered. He's saying, I have been generous. Of course, Jesus explains to the Laodiceans that they were neither. Perhaps this story will further explain the difference between these two definitions of the word rich. There was a German industrialist years ago, before World War II, who had built a manufacturing company and was very successful. He and his wife decided to use some of their money to buy an organ for the church. Shortly thereafter, World War II broke out and his factory was totally bombed, leaving he and his wife absolutely devastated financially. That Sunday, they visited the small church that they attended and grief-stricken and without almost any words to say, the husband sat in the pew staring at the organ. And then after several minutes of silence, he turned to his wife and he said, the only thing that we've kept is what we gave away. You know, being rich towards God is not an effort on God's part. It's an effort on our part by being generous with the blessings that he's already given us. So with regards to the church of Laodicea, it appears that Jesus is talking to believers who are healthy, happy, financially sound in their own minds, but they are like the rich young ruler. They are not rich or generous towards God. They do not recognize God nor honor his blessings by using a portion of their first fruits to bless others. Now, obviously, this group of believers believe in the covenant of salvation towards God, but they have not participated in the financial responsibilities, empowering the full benefits of that covenant. Now, in regard to the New Testament believers' approach towards God and money, Scripture is very clear as to what our priorities should be. John says, God wishes above all things that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Now, this verse prioritizes that the most important asset you have is your soul, not your material assets. Remember, Deuteronomy 18 said, Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, and he establishes it through you. But what exactly is that covenant? Paul taught us in Romans 11 that through Christ we are grafted into the Jewish family by having our hearts circumcised. He then further states the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now the first priority of that promise concerns our eternal souls in that Paul stated salvations of the Jews. And he who believes in Christ has actually become a Jew. So although tithing in the Old Testament was the letter of the law, in the New Testament, it now rests in the spirit of the law. In other words, it is a voluntary effort on every believer's part to participate. To not tithe means you will not participate in the blessings, but to tithe means you will initiate a divine reciprocity between you and God. Reciprocity means giving and receiving. Now, according to scripture, the richest and wisest descendant of Abraham was King Solomon, who reigned in approximately 1000 BC. However, King Solomon never had a gas furnace, air conditioning, electricity, never had a microwave oven, an electric stove, or hot and cold running water. He never spoke on a cell phone, text a friend, or surfed on the internet. That technology has all been invented within the last hundred years. Yet today, in North America, we have all these things, and most people complain that they don't have enough, and some even protest against the one percenters 
who have even greater wealth than they do. Now, in many regions of the world, uh, people beg for food, while we in North America pay other people to help us lose weight. What we call poor in America lives within the top 14% of the world's richest people. In other words, 86% of the world has less than 99% of us living in North America. Do you think it's possible that in the last days, the church of Laodicea could be found in the richest country in the history of the world? And we already know that the richest country in the history of the world is prophesied to be Babylon the Great. And Babylon the Great appears before the new world order comes into power. Now, is it possible that the falling away of the church Paul spoke about could have anything to do with how we use our money? Are the majority of Christians in North America rich within themselves and not rich or generous towards God? Now, according to a recent survey in Christianity Today, less than 10% of Christian families tithe. Tithers underrate underwrite almost 90% of the church's expenses and outreach ministries. Are 90% of church members missing the mark when it comes to stewardship of their finances? Do they represent the modern day church of Laodicea? Corinthians says that God places seed in the hand of the sower and multiplies the seed sown and increases the fruits of your righteousness or acts of loving kindness. Deuteronomy said God gives you power to get wealth, but unless some of that wealth is sown or given into other people's lives, it cannot bear the acts of loving kindness or righteousness that Jesus taught us. The Old Testament principle of tithing is a common thread that runs through the first book of Genesis and right through to the last book of Malachi. Abraham, the father of our faith, sets an example, showing us that the first fruit portion to God was 10% or a tithe. First Corinthians, Paul warns us there's a judgment day when each one's works will be tested by fire. If the work survives the fire, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through fire. Laodicea is the only church that Jesus literally tells how to repent when he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich with white garments so that you might clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness might not be seen. Now, the word here, buy, is the word, the Greek word, agorazo, which means to redeem. Paul used this word in 1 Corinthians in describing how Christ bought us or redeemed us through his own blood at Calvary. Revelation also uses the word when it says Christ was slain and has redeemed us, agorazo, to God by his blood. However, in this verse, Jesus is literally saying to the Laodicean believers to redeem yourself from the sin of greed by literally transferring a portion of your personal wealth or money into God's kingdom. Now, according to Jesus, this is the only way Laodicean believers will become rich in God. Jesus promised that you will be given a white garment. And according to 2 Corinthians 9.10, you will increase the fruits of your righteousness or acts of loving kindness. For he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, Paul explains the difference in how God sees our money when he stated, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from their faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy 3, Paul refers to money that is coveted after as being greedy of filthy lucre. 
However, when money is used correctly as a medium of exchange to bless others, Paul told the Philippians, you sent me help for my needs and once again, not that I desire a gift, but rather I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now he was talking about a heavenly account. For I have received the things which were sent of you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable and well-pleasing unto God. Paul calls money greedy, gained as filthy lucre. But if money is used to minister to others in God's eyes, it becomes an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Now, several years ago, I received a phone call from my alma mater, Oral Roberts University. I was 32 years old at the time and had been in business for over nine years since my graduation. And at the time, the university was heavily involved in medical mission outreaches to third world nations. They were looking for alumni to volunteer their time and their money on the Board of Regents to assist in that initiative. After pondering the request, I realized that I had grown weary of well-doing. I was a believer in Christ, but I was offering very little personal time and financial support to fulfill the commission in spreading the gospel into all the world. A tremendous conviction came upon me as I looked at the many blessings that God had given me. At the age of seven, I'd prayed the sinner's prayer and received Christ as Lord and Savior. At 18, God gave me an incredible experience as in the day of Pentecost. Yet, 14 years later, I had friends who were giving their lives as pastors, missionaries, evangelists, etc. But what was I doing? They were giving their lives to help others, and here I was reaping the rewards of a successful business and not even giving a 10% tithe or my first fruits to God's kingdom. Now, the prophet Malachi explained perfectly where I was in my personal life. Even from the days of your father, you are gone away from mine ordinances and not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But you say, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourers for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Wow. You know, it was like this passage had been written directly to me. After 25 years of accepting Christ as Savior at seven years old, I'd lost my first love, just like the believers of Ephesus. I was doing dead works unto myself, just like the believers of Sardis. Being single, I was struggling with the moral temptations of Pergamos and Thyatira. And now I found myself literally in the same condition as the believers in Laodicea. The prophet Malachi said I was a thief. I was robbing God by not giving him the first fruits of his material blessings. Now, when it comes to your finances, Jesus is either Lord of all or not at all. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying to follow God, you have to shave your head and go hand out flowers at the airport. But a tenth of my substance was sitting in a bank account and it was not much to ask if I could use that to help starving children in a third world country. So after much prayer, I decided to take one tenth of my net worth and I gave it to medical missions. Once I released those funds, over the next seven days, something supernatural began happening to me that happened to two men in the Bible. According to Acts 10, Cornelius was a Roman centurion who one night saw a vision an angel coming to him, calling out his name. And Cornelius was afraid. And the angel said, Fear not, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God, Cornelius. Now, in this passage, Cornelius' actions of giving, and off, of giving alms and offerings 
opened the windows of heaven and God poured out to him revelation knowledge with the angel instructing him to go to Peter who would explain God's plan of salvation. Now, previous to this time, Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And Peter responded, thou art the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father who art in heaven. Now, similar to Cornelius, after I released my tithes and offerings to God, I received the prophetic insight or revelation knowledge concerning things to come in North America. I will not go into further detail on that event, but the written word that we are teaching at Prophecy USA confirms the spoken word I received at that time. And I can assure you that flesh and blood did not reveal this unto me. Now, before this experience, I had no idea of the eight providential nations we've learned in scripture, and certainly not the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. To my knowledge, our interpretation of the book of Revelation has not been taught before with this depth of scripture. However, no other nation in history has ever met every description of Babylon the Great before, like America is presently fulfilling right now. The richest nation in the history of the world houses all seven churches described by Jesus. The sins, the immorality, the Baal worship, the wealthy lifestyle of believers are all abundantly transparent. In fact, 90% of believers in America meet the description of the church of Laodicea who refuse to participate financially with first fruit offerings to God's kingdom. Now, if you find yourself falling short of any of the sins found in these churches, it's not too late to make a change. You can follow my lead. Dust off your Bible Examine yourself, your morals, your priorities, and then do something about it. The next time you go to the fridge, eat a meal, dine in a restaurant, ask yourself, have I given to the Lord what is his? Have I transferred a portion of my first fruit blessings into God's eternal kingdom? Remember, you can hear directly from God. You don't need anyone to tell you where, when, or who you should give tithes and offerings to his kingdom. God has given you the power to get wealth. He will also give you the power to distribute his first fruits wherever they need to be planted. And scripture foretells us that there is a tremendous mystery, a blessing coming to those who dwell in Babylon the Great. While Jesus warns, Pray that you might be worthy to escape, but escape what? That will be explained next week as we unveil once again the hidden mysteries of America's role in Bible prophecy. This is Prophecy USA. My name is Rick Pearson, and I'm reminding you Jesus is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. See you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom. Thank you.